In earlier lectures, we looked at how you might collect your own barcode sequences, such as uh, CO2 or CO1, and how we can use these to build phylogenies. We also looked a little bit at how you might harvest such DNA barcode sequences in bulk, for example, by talking to a web service such as provided by Bold. But building phylogenies is not the only thing that we can do with sufficiently large sets of DNA barcode sequences. We can also use these to identify where the boundaries between species might be. So this is the topic of species delim delimitation, so what delimits species. And the basic challenge here is to uh, group DNA sequences into operational taxonomic units that are supposed to correspond with species. So in this lecture, I will go over a couple of different methods for doing this kind of clustering to form OTUs and we'll look at the different algorithms and then finally we'll look at an application where we uh, basically in bulk went through barcodes at bolts to see what those actually have to say about species boundaries. So let's begin with what bolt does. So bolt uh, has come up with this clever acronym uh, BIN for barcode index number, but of course what they're doing is binning sequences. So we'll see how that works, and then we will look at uh, two methods that basically apply the same kind of principle, uh, which is to do with comparing what kind of uh, genetic diversity you would expect within species, and what kind of uh, diversity and therefore genetic distance you would expect between species. So that's both in the automatic barcode gap discovery method and the Poisson tree process. Then we will look at a method that considers both processes that we basically uh, see as giving rise to tree shapes when those trees are based on both multiple sequences within species and uh, multiple species. So then there's a mixture of both population genetics and diversification, which we will discuss when we talk about the generalized mixed Yule coalescent method. And then finally, we will have a brief rejoinder about the issue of monophyly, polyphyly, and paraphyly, and how we might define that programmatically. And then if we, uh, can do that in a little program, well, then we should be able to mine bolts to see to what extent different clades are entangled in polyphyly or paraphyly when we look at their underlying sequence data. So that's the outline for this lecture. Let's start with the barcode index number. So this is a method that was published a couple of years ago by the uh, two leading lights of BOLT, uh, Sujeev van Ratnasingam, who is more the technical guy, I think, and Paul Hebert, who is more the vision guy. And uh, in this paper here, they uh, present how their clustering or binning algorithm works. And they identify uh, a couple of different things that you might encounter when you apply such a method. So these four figures uh, at the bottom of the uh, slide give four different possible outcomes. Now the ideal case is all the way on the left. Here we have um, a set of sequences which have all been annotated as belonging to species A. So whoever uh, submitted these sequences thought they had identified correctly that this is species A, capital A, uh, circled uh, in blue and then those sequences were clustered and it turns out that the clusters matched exactly the species so this is the ideal case the sequence data corresponds with whatever taxonomic assignments were made the next case is one where within a single species uh, 
actually there's some substructure in the genetic diversity. So there might be multiple quite distinct clusters. And in this case, the species by the rules of the binning would be split. And so you can imagine that this would be something like a cryptic species type of situation where we have multiple distinct clusters with little gene flow between them. Now, another possibility is if uh, a cluster actually spans multiple species. So here we have uh, species capital A and species capital B, and their sequences form a single merged cluster. Maybe because the marker is not evolving very rapidly, for example, compared to how the species boundaries have been formed in other ways. Now the final case is kind of the worst of uh, both worlds. So here we have two species, capital A, capital B, and within uh, one of those species there's a significant substructure so that multiple uh, distinct clusters are identified. But then these uh, clusters kind of spill over into another species. So there's a mixture both of splitting and merging within the data set, which is probably the most difficult case, but therefore probably also the most interesting. Now, how does BOLD arrive at such results? So what they do is they run a pipeline, which very broadly speaking consists of the following steps. Firstly, most of the barcode markers uh, on BOLD are protein coding, and that's kind of useful because that allows you to align very large sets of DNA sequences against the amino acid sequence as a, what's called a profile. And you can think of it maybe as kind of like a template or scaffolding against which you can glue the sequences, right? This is also called a hidden Markov model alignment. And so, for example, one of the tools that you could use for this is called Hammer, which, of course, because the HMM is in the name, isn't it? So having created a very, very large uh, sequence alignment against the uh, amino acid profile, then the next step is to try and look, okay, who is similar to uh, who else in the total set? So here you might basically start with any random seed sequence, just the first of the bunch, and then uh, look at which other one in the set is most similar to this one. Now, having found that second one, it is not necessarily a given that that one is also uh, most similar uh, to the first one. So this is not necessarily symmetrical. Maybe the second one has yet another closest match and then transitively that one might also have yet another close match that we hadn't seen yet. So what we might end up constructing is pretty long kind of paths or stretched out little subnetworks of things that are transitively similar to one another but that span a very large path through the total set. So that's not really very elegant. And then therefore the third step is to try to kind of center these long paths. So then what uh, is being done is to find kind of central sequences or uh, attractors and try to draw contours around those to tidy things up and to have things not so stretched out, but kind of like lumped into uh, neat clusters. Now, how well does that work in relation to a previously defined species? They did an analysis and they looked in a bunch of different uh, cases to see how this turns out. So here there's eight different cases of different large sets of taxa. And uh, for each of these cases, they then looked at, well, what is the effect of the uh, allowed amount of sequence divergence for two sequences to still be considered members of the same cluster. So think of this as kind of like a button that you can turn, a knob, uh, 
and uh, it ranges from uh, 0.1% sequence divergence, so very, very similar uh, across a thousand bases, only one difference is allowed, and if there's any greater difference, they are no longer in the same cluster. Uh, two, well, when we turn that dial all the way to the other end, uh, there's 6% sequence divergence, which is kind of high, uh, not excessively so, but obviously a lot higher than 0.1%. So that's on the x-axis, and then the y-axis uh, plots sort of what the composition is of the set of outcomes that you get under that uh, divergence threshold. So here's some of the things that we can take from this. Uh, actually, in most cases, uh, taxonomically, and most divergence thresholds, there's a good match between the clusters that are constructed and the species that were thought to be there. So that's the green zone at the bottom of each of these plots. So it's kind of a little bit of a bump uh, towards low uh, divergence levels, but for most of these plots, it occupies most of the space. So that's nice. Now, if we dial up the divergence to kind of high levels, then at some point we become so lenient that these clusters start spreading across species boundaries, spilling over and into each other, and then multiple species are being merged. So this happens more on the right hand of each of these panels when sequence divergence is quite high, uh, and in the yellow zones, so the top right of each of these plots. Conversely, if sequence divergence is kept very low, so we are being very conservative and we consider things only to be in the same cluster if they are only maybe diverging by 1% or 0.1% uh, or 0.5% or something like that, well, then we get this case where the uh, structure in the genetic diversity within the species uh, starts to play a role. And because then we kind of elevate those clusters to a higher level and we start actually splitting the sp species into multiple of these molecular OTUs. That's these uh, orange zones that are in the top left of each of these plots. Then the uh, weird case where we both have splits and merges uh, within species, uh, that is obviously kind of uh, rare, but it uh, happens uh, sometimes, especially at low divergence levels, and that's that uh, red zone. So take home message is that uh, BIN is a pretty good method uh, in the sense that uh, scanning across large uh, data sets in bold, uh, it is fairly congruent with the species as they have been recognized previously, but obviously there it's not uh, perfect either. Now, this bin doesn't really take into consideration that maybe um, what's happening within a species uh, is different than what happens between species. For example, when we start comparing sequences within and between species. So remember here we have a, a very large data set with uh, sequences where for each species in the set there's a bunch of sequences and then there's a bunch of species. Now if we then take any pair of sequences from that set, basically two things can be the case, either they uh, belong to the same species or they are in different species. Now, what do we expect for what kind of patterns of uh, distance between these sequences we're going to see? Well, in the kind of idealized case, uh, we expect to see something like shown in panel A. So panel A is a histogram, and on the x-axis is a pairwise difference. So uh, all the way on the left, there's very similar sequences. So uh, it's a distance class that is very short. And all the way on the right are the long distances. Uh, 
and then on the y-axis, so this is a histogram, so these values are, are binned in a couple of bars and then turned into counts along the y-axis. And what we're supposed to take from this is this, this is kind of like a, a bimodal uh, distribution where we have one mode where we see on the left these distances that are within species, they're pretty close to each other, and then the other mode on the right-hand side of panel A is all the distances between species. You can imagine that uh, each species is, uh, is a gene pool, so that pool has obviously a homogenizing effect. So when we look at the uh, uh, distances between two members of the same species, that is really qualitatively shorter than once we jump out of one gene pool and jump, you know, run across the field and jump into the next one. Um, well, that's going to be quite a bit farther because these gene pools have been separated by evolutionary time. And uh, during that time, a whole bunch of differences have become fixed. So just to start out with, any pair that crosses these species boundaries uh, is already going to be more distal from each other. Now, panel B, B then uh, kind of reorders this information. And now it says, well, we're just going to take each distance in the set of pairwise distances and uh, rank them and order them from uh, short distance to long distance. So on the left, on the x-axis, these are very short pairwise sequence distances. And then... Uh, on the right, there's uh, the large distances, and then on the y-axis is uh, indicated what that distance is. So here then is kind of the salient point. You can see that panel B has this sigmoid S-shaped uh, curve. And so what we are looking at is starting uh, in the lower left, we go through all the uh, sequences that are within the same species, then all of a sudden there's a great jump in the kind of distances that we're seeing, and they were going to go on with all those distances that are between species. Now with a curve like this, we can obviously uh, come up with the slope of the curve in some way or another. And so the slope in this case is, well, uh, shallow, you know, that's not a very steep increase for a while. Then all of a sudden the slope goes up very steeply and then it uh, goes down again, right? So imagine some kind of derivative, right? So that is shown in panel C. So panel C shows how this slope um, develops as you go through the rank order on the x-axis, so the same order as panel B. And you can see there's a spike there uh, indicated with the dashed line. So that spike is where we have now discovered what the barcode gap is between species in this data set. And then we can use that as kind of a data-driven way of coming up with what level of divergence do we use as a cutoff rather than just using some kind of arbitrary value like, oh, 97%. Here we try to let the data tell us what it is. And there's a tool that does that for you, a uh, command line tool, uh, a little program, and uh, you can run it on uh, aligned FASTA data. So here, for example, I did that on the uh, aligned uh, data for those butterflies from Bolt. And then uh, the output is a directory that contains a whole bunch of different output files. But this is just to show that rank order of these uh, distances, showing kind of that uh, sigmoid curve. In this case, there's very many distances between species and not a lot within species, apparently. And uh, looking at the data, that's the case because for a whole bunch of species, there's not all that many different sequences. Now that same principle uh, can also be applied to trees instead of just pairwise sequence distances. The principle is just the same. Uh, there's probably a qualitative difference between the pairwise distances within any given species 
uh, versus the pairwise distances between members of different species. And uh, this tree is meant to kind of illustrate that. So here you can see that uh, on this tree there's little clades with sort of brush-like shapes with a bunch of different terminal branches that are kind of short. And here the idea is, well, those would be the species. And then there's interior branches that are really substantially longer. Well, those must be then the distances between species. So short ones within, long ones between. Now, you can do this with uh, trees that are not ultrametric because basically what you're doing here is you take a, a phylogram and kind of reverse engineer the distance matrix from it. And then you go look for patterns in that distance matrix. So obviously, if you have built a distance tree from a distance matrix, well, then that tree shape roughly represents the distances within the matrix. And so conversely, if we take the distance between all combinations of, of pairs, then we can populate the distance matrix again, right? So that kind of logic of these different uh, distance classes uh, is also here applied to these trees using uh, this method called the Poisson tree process. And in this case, there's a web server. And um, I applied this to the a data set and it said, well, uh, I estimate that the number of species is between 14 and 135. Um, the uh, pr prior answer based on just the taxonomic assignments for the sequences was that there's 15 species. So the lower bound's pretty close, the upper bound is just elevating every single tip to species level. Now, okay, we can quite crudely look at what, in a, what we think might be happening within and between gene pools in the sense that, well, it's probably closer within than uh, between. But it probably helps if we try to be a little bit more explicit about what the different processes are that are actually driving these differences. So remember that we have a set of within and between species. And so we have a tree where some of the branches and their lengths are accumulated by processes that happen within the species and others by processes that happen over longer stretches of time as species diverge from one another. Now at the population level, uh, if you sample any two individuals from that are the same species and within the same population or meta population or whatever basically what you're doing is um, sampling from a very large uh, extended family and of course not all the members of that family are genetically identical um, at least let's take that as a assumption right now <laughs> and um so, for example, uh, uh, none of us direct, uh, like, I fully identically resemble any of our parents, and so our siblings are also a little bit different, and so are uh, our cousins and or whichever other relatives that you have. Um, but in many cases, those mutations or those little snips uh, might maybe only just uh, occur in ourselves, or in any case, they're not somehow fixed throughout the whole species. They kind of appear or disappear, uh, merge and split as the, the gene pool is traveling through time. And um, if we sample within that, then sure, we're going to see a lot of little differences that allow us to build a tree within that population. But that is uh, happening at a totally different time scale than what's happening between species. So if we consider what's happening uh, you know, retrospectively what we are looking at as we are looking at deeper branches in a tree, so the branches that separate species, well, where do those branches come from? Not from uh, individuals inheriting a snip from their parents, uh, 
uh, no, no, uh, these are differences between species. So first of all, for any of those splits to happen deeper in the tree, there has to have happened a speciation event. Now, those are kind of rare, uh, right? All gene pools have to separate. And then subsequently, whatever differences we are looking at between those species are differences that have become probably for the most part fixed between those species. So it's, it's much rarer for uh, you know these SNPs to accumulate and spread throughout the population and then another and then another. And if we think real quick about how long those branches are, obviously for them to accumulate all that length from uh, fixed uh, differences, well, obviously that takes a lot longer. So that's a much more slowly, uh, much slower process. Now, the process within populations uh, just to tease apart what the uh, abbreviation here means, uh, those processes are sometimes called coalescent. And here the uh, reason for that is that uh, when you look at these population pro processes and uh, you kind of traverse them backwards, then these uh, individual lineages and their SNPs kind of coalesce in their uh, ancestors. Now, it's not really something that we're going to go into in this course, but in, a, in any case, these uh, population level processes are often referred to as coalescent processes. On the other hand, uh, the processes where different species separate from one another and uh, accumulate through time, well, this is a little bit like the simulation that we did uh, in the browser with those uh, dots traveling across the canvas. There's a um, parameter that says how often they split up. So that's basically a birth process. Uh, and then in that simulation, there was also another slider that we could move to say, well, how quickly do they die or where, how many of them go extinct? So in many cases, we model these uh, processes where different evolutionary lineages diversify as a combination of birth and death. And we might also see that when we look at beast. Um, but in this case, we uh, consider uh, a simpler case where we only uh, take birth of these lineages into account. And that simple model is often referred to as the U model. So hence generalized mixed U coalescent. Okay, so what does that kind of look like? Well, consider the tree on the right. From that tree, we can plot the uh, leftmost panel. So that is a what's called a lineage through time plot or LTT plot. Here on the x-axis, we have uh, evolutionary time. Uh, leftmost is the root and on the right is the present. So these negative numbers sort of go back in time, right? And then on the y-axis is the number of lineages that exist at that time. And because on this tree, we only ever consider the lineages that have reached the present, right? We don't know what else has gone extinct and just disappeared. Uh, because of that, this curve just, you know, monotonously increases. Um, and it does that exponentially because if any lineage is equally likely to speciate at any time, then the more lineages you have at that time, the more likely any of them is to speciate, and that then puts even more lineages into the game. So the y-axis, well, is uh, log transformed because of that exponential growth. And after the log transformation, we can see that um, quite a lot of the curve starting from the root, so all the way on the left up to the red line. Uh, yeah, you could roughly draw a regression line to it. And of course, there's a little bit of acceleration in the beginning and then deceleration, but it's roughly linear after the uh, log transformation with some particular slope. 
then after that red line you see that slope become a lot steeper. So here under this logic of the Yule process in the beginning and the coalescent later on, we can now understand why that uh, rapid increase near the present is happening. And the trick is then to find out where that inflection point is, where that slope uh, becomes more steep, because now what we're looking at is just uh, differences between individuals within the same gene pool. And that is what's uh, happening in the middle panel. So here, again, traveling through time, uh, a clever algorithm is trying to figure out what the maximum likelihood estimate is for that inflection point, so where the slope suddenly changes. And the uh, maximum likelihood estimate is here at the highest point in the graph, so you can see that that is that peak uh, quite near the present. So having discovered where that peak is, we can now use that as a threshold and anything that's to the right of that threshold, if we superimpose it on our tree, is going to be branching events that happen within a species. So there's just population genetic processes going on. And anything to the left of that is uh, evolutionary diversification processes. So having discovered that threshold through the data, then uh, anything that's to the right of that uh, all belongs to the same OTU, is the idea. And applying that again to the butterfly data, we can see how this performs. Uh, so again, this is with a uh, web service. And here, well, it comes with a couple of estimates with uh, some confidence intervals around them. Uh, but it's pretty close, right? Uh, 15 distinct names. Well, maybe it's uh, 15 distinct OTUs with a bit of uncertainty around it. So again, pretty good. Now, if we have all these DNA barcodes and uh, we can build trees from on them and we have all these barcodes annotated with taxonomic names, how often are we actually wrong in the aggregate? So how often do we get somehow uh, splitting and merging uh, if we look at DNA barcode trees? And I was involved in a little study where we looked at that and we wanted to go through um, uh, as many barcode gene trees as we could construct for uh, European Lepidoptera, so butterflies. And as a quick diagnostic for finding out whether there was something to look at more closely, we wanted to find all the trees that have para or polyphyletic species in them. Uh, just an, another brief uh, recap, what was that again? So in this case shown in the primates, here we have uh, the backbone of the primate phylogeny, and then in the uh, top right we have this uh, clade that goes from the New World monkeys to the humans uh, with yellow background. Those might be called simia, sort of monkeys and apes. Uh, that's a monophyletic group because all of them uh, if we go from them to their most recent common ancestor, well, uh, that most recent common ancestor subtends exactly that same set of tips. So, monophyletic. Now, if we look at another group that has had some currency in the past among zoologists, uh, well, there's this group that uh, was considered, um, and uh, that was called the prosimians. So... If we have simians and prosimians, you can see that we're already kind of moving in the direction of uh, ancestral and derived species, which is just very, very bad. Um, and you can see also uh, what is happening here. Well, the so the lemurs are those cute primates from Madagascar, right? Uh, quite closely related to them, relatively speaking, are uh, the lorises. So uh, that's uh, these... Uh, mostly nocturnal primates uh, from mainland Africa. Uh, and then 
there's another group called the tarsiers, which is these little small uh, primates, which also have these very big kind of ET looking eyes. Um, and, you know, looking at them, uh, a lot of people have thought, well, these are all quote unquote primitive. So let's call them the pro simians, but that creates a paraphyletic group. And it gets even worse when we get totally carried away by this nocturnal habit of lorises and tarsiers and their cute big eyes, and we lump those together, uh, shown here in red. Well, that's a polyphyletic group. But then what exactly is the objective uh, metric here? Well, for that, we're going to do a little bit of computer science in our heads. So we are going to run through uh, a five-step algorithm written out here and we're going to apply that on the tree on the left. So this tree has uh, four different species in it, A, B, C and D. And for each of those species there's uh, two sequences, A1, A2, B1, B2, C1, C2 and D1, D2. Now, following the steps of the recipe, let's see what we then uh, discover about uh, species A. So, uh, for species A, in step one, collect all tips that belong to it. So, we look in the tree and we find there's A1 and A2. That's all the, spe that's all the tips that belong to A. In step two, find the most recent common ancestor for the collected tips. So, for A1, A2. Well, the most recent common ancestor uh, of those two is node N3. For N3, in step 3, the instruction is collect all descendants of the most recent common ancestor. If this set of descendants is identical to the set of step 1, the taxon is monophyletic and we're done. Well, that is the case for uh, species A. Uh, because the set of all descendants from node N3 is the set A1, A2, and we, if we compare that set to the set from step 1, it's identical. Okay, species A, monophyletic. Now let's have a look at species B. So collect all tips that belong to it, B1, B2. Find the most recent common ancestor for the collected tips, that is node N3. Four, collect all descendants of the most recent common ancestor. That's B1, C1, and B2. If this set is identical to the set of step one, the taxon is monophyletic and we're done. Okay, it's not identical, so we're not done. Okay, then uh, we are going to now proceed on to step four. So here it says, collect all nodes that subtend tips from the focal taxon as well as at least one other taxon. Let's deal with that first. So uh, that's the nodes where at least one of the descendants is one of B. So that is node uh, N5, that's node N4, and it's also node N2. Then the instruction is, now sort these by their post order index. Okay, so what is that? Well, you'll notice that uh, for all these interior nodes, uh, after the node name, so N1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, after that there's in each case a pair of numbers between curly braces. The first of each of these numbers is an index that was applied in what's called a pre-order traversal. So what does that mean? It means as you travel across the tree, um, you apply a number first to the parent and then to its child. So when we look at the first number between each of these pairs of curly braces, the root is, has a pre-order index of 1, and 2 has 2, and 3 has three, four, five, six, seven, right? It just matches the node label in this case. And the important point to take from this is that children always have a higher index than their parents. Now, 
when applying these indices, once we've reached the tips, we then start traveling back again, and then we are applying the second number between the curly braces. So, for example, we starting at the note N5, then the label 8 is applied, or the index 8, and 9 uh, uh, to N4, 10 to N3, uh, 11 to N2, and then 12 and 13 to N7 and N6, respectively. And then finally the root uh, brings it all together in 14. So the neat thing about this technique is that if you have sets of nodes that you're programming against, uh, you can then quickly uh, figure out whether they form a nested set on a tree shape. So for example, for node N2, we can figure out what all the interior nodes are that descend from it, because they must all have a pre-order index greater than 2, and a post-order index smaller than 11. Right? So that then selects nodes N3, N4, and N5. Same logic obviously can be applied to the root and to node N6. Okay, so then we sort the nodes by their post order index. So that means we sort the nodes from uh, youngest to oldest in step four. And then in step five, the instruction is group the collected sorted nodes into distinct root to tip paths. Internal nodes that are nested in each other identif are identified and collected in the same group by checking that the pre-order index of the focal node is larger and the post-order index of the focal node is smaller than that of the next node in the sorted list. So this is that nesting logic, right? Now, with this trick, we can figure out that for a node, for the tips B1 and B2, they, uh, their uh, ancestors, which we collected in step four, are all on the same path. They are all nested within each other, right? N4 nests within, N5 nests within N4, and N4 nests within N2. So there's only one distinct root to tip path. And actually the final sentence of step five tells us if that's the case, then that's paraphyletic. Because now if we look at uh, species C, and we look at uh, C1 and C2, then the nodes that we start collecting are uh, N6, and on the other hand, N5, N4, and N2. And with this indexing system, we can now figure out that they belong to uh, distinct paths. And if we have distinct paths, that's polyphyly. So that is, for example, uh, think real quick back to uh, those uh, tarsiers and lorises. Well, the tarsiers, uh, together with the lemurs, take a left turn from the root of the primates. And, um, uh, sorry, the lorises and lemurs do that. And on the other side of the root are the tarsiers. And by then grouping the lorises and the tarsiers, we've created two separate paths to the root. Same as for C1 and C2. So that's the uh, mechanics of this little al algorithm. Uh, and we didn't just figure out how to do it because, well, you can also just look at the tree, but we wrote the code to do it. And then we built a, a web service that does that. And because we are very, very imaginative, we called that web service the monophilizer. Uh, so this is a little web service that uh, runs on the infrastructure of Naturalis and you can go to the web page and upload some data and run an analysis like that. Uh, it also has, again, one of those uh, web service APIs, so you can run from the terminal window analyses on this script and run big batches of your trees through it. Uh, and in that way, you can do a great big survey of a very large group and look at what kind of patterns do we see in there barcode gene trees. So for example, what we saw was uh, again that there's very often good matches between uh, uh, clusters on trees 
from the sequence data and what the, the uh, people who identified those specimens had to say about it, but sometimes not. And then when we looked a bit more closely, there was a bunch of different categories. Uh, so some of them had to do with basically tree building method errors. So just the tree was probably wrong. Um, uh, other cases were uh, probably misidentifications of the specimens. So those actually belong to a different species. And then, of course, uh, there's a couple more interesting cases where we're actually looking at some biological phenomenon where species boundaries are quite ambiguous. So that was interesting, we thought at least. In the next lecture, we will look a bit more at, well, what are then these species names that are applied to these sequences? So how might we define what a species is? And uh, we might... Uh, do a quick review of different species concepts, but that is up to Jeremy. Thank you very much for listening.